Hey there, everybody. My name is Breck Wainwright. Today's lecture topic is going to be early European wildlife conservation policy. By early, we're mostly going to be focusing on the late 70s to the early 90s for this lecture. Some of the learning objectives I want you to focus on today are coexistence as a conservation paradigm. Wildlife management philosophy is slightly different in Europe, so I wanted to compare and contrast how we do things here in the United States versus how they do things in Europe. The second topic I want to go over is the history and the nuts and bolts of the Pan-European Convention on the Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats of 1979. Because that rolls right off the tongue, we're going to be referring to it as the Bern Convention for the rest of today's lecture. We're also going to be talking about the EU nature directives, which consist of two pieces of legislation. The first one is Directive 2009-147, or the Conservation of Wild Birds of 1979. The second one is going to be Directive 92-43, or the Conservation of Natural Habitats and of Wild Fauna and Flora of 1992. Uh, both, both of those are a mouthful, so we're going to be referring to them as the Birds Directive and the Habitats Directive, respectively. The next topic is going to be the role and reach of the Council of Europe. Next is the challenges of transboundary wildlife management. We're mostly going to be focusing on larger game species and large carnivores. And finally, we're going to be talking about a wildlife conservation slash reintroduction success story in Europe that has some parallels to a conservation reintroduction success story we have here in the United States. Some of the questions I want you folks to be able to answer by the end of my lecture today is one, what is the coexistence conservation paradigm? Two, true or false after joining the Berne Convention, a country or state can be granted exemptions if they discuss the reservations with the standing committee. And three, what is the largest challenge to transboundary wildlife management in Europe? So before I begin my lecture proper, I wanted to give you all the quick and dirty about what the European Union is, or the EU for short. So it's an economic and political union between 27 different countries. It arose after World War II because a lot of these countries decided that World War III wasn't exactly a great idea. So let's do something to prevent that. And I also wanted to give you all a little geography lesson today and show you some of the really interesting countries that aren't in the Union. So in the far north over here, you have Norway. In Central Europe, you have Switzerland. You have a really interesting collection of countries down here in the southeast, collectively called the Balkan Peninsula. Some of the countries in that area include Bosnia and Herzegovina. You have Montenegro, Serbia, Albania, Kosovo, and Macedonia. And why I wanted to highlight them is you have this vast coastline to the west over here. And in the eastern part of this of these collection of countries, you have these vast mountain ranges. So a really ecologically diverse part of the continent right there. I also wanted to point out Eastern Europe as well. You have Belarus, you have Ukraine, you have Moldova and big bad Russia over here. Uh, given the geopolitical climate of this part of the continent currently and the war going on, I think there's going to be a lot of future wildlife management issues that are going to arise in this part of the world. In the southeast, you have Turkey. And finally, over here, you have the United Kingdom. They're the only country that have left the European Union before, and they did that in 2016 with the Brexit vote. So now we'll get into the real nitty gritty of this presentation. We'll start off with the coexistence conservation paradigm. And this, there's a really dominant pervasive idea in European wildlife management that nature and culture are intertwined with one another and they coexist with one another. And I was thinking that this sounded really similar to the Native American philosophy, but given how differently Europeans and Native Americans value the land, this, this is definitely not a perfect analogy. Uh, many of the protected lands in Europe consist of intensely managed private lands like farm fields and private forests. And a lot of the current conservation actions throughout Europe 
focus on biodiversity on fertile farmland. European wildlife conservation is really defined by blurred boundaries between public and private lands, protected areas in the wider landscape, and wild and domestic animals. So now let's do a brief compare and contrast between European wildlife management philosophies and North American wildlife management philosophies. We're going to start with Europe. As we discussed on the last slide, they heavily emphasize coexistence between culture and nature and farmland conservation and agricultural policy. We have some of that in the United States as well, especially with how we manage our farmlands and passing agricultural policy, but it's not in, as intensely focused as it is in Europe. On our side of the pond, our wildlife management paradigm focuses on wilderness, protected areas, and wildlife corridors, especially like habitat connectivity. There's a clear distinction between native wild habitats and not wild areas. So you're not going to find a state park or a national wildlife refuge inside of a small suburban town or a major city in the United States. Europe is also starting to bite in and lean in towards our ideas a little bit. So they're trying their own projects with rewilding as we showed on the last slide. And there's more of a focus or they're starting to transition towards more of a focus on wilderness. The reason why I think these differences between our philosophies exist is because the United States is a lot younger than Europe and we had this huge environmentally conscious awakening uh, early into our history. Our country is only, both of our countries, the United States and Canada, are a little over 250 years old. And we were able to kind of come to these conclusions that natural resources and the environment can only supply so many resources and we have to do our best to conserve them. Meanwhile, in Europe, some of these countries are thousands of years old and have been developed and most of their natural resources have been destroyed or gone for generations now. So they're kind of, it's kind of forced their hand a little bit and they're forced to focus on more of the coexistence between culture and nature. Now let's talk about the Berne Convention. The full name again for this convention is the Pan-European Convention on the Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats of 1979. It gets its name because it was signed in Bern, Switzerland in 1979, but did not come fully into effect until 1982. It's administered by the Council of Europe, who we're going to talk about a little bit later in this lecture. Currently, there's 51 contracting members of the Berne Convention. It includes all 27 member nations of the European Union. It includes non-EU countries across Eurasia. So that's kind of where the UK, uh, the Balkan Peninsula, and Norway come in. They can be part of the Berne Convention, but not part of the EU. And it also includes four African states as well. And those are Burkina Faso, Morocco, Tunisia, and Senegal. This is straight from the horse's mouth. These are the five basic tenets that the Council of Europe would like all members of the Berne Convention to uphold to. The first is to promote national conservation policies. The next is to promote policies and measures against pollution. The third is to promote educational and informational measures. The fourth is to coordinate efforts to protect migratory species. And the fifth is to establish legislative and administrative measures. These are the basics of the Berne Convention. So there are 24 articles total, which are basically rules for the member states of the Berne Convention to follow. And there are four appendices. For the purposes of today's lecture, we're not going to go over all 24 articles of the Berne Convention, and we're going to kind of glance over them. Your homework this week is going to be going into the articles into a little more detail. Anyway, so the member states of the Berne Convention take a all or nothing approach when joining. Obligations are usually pretty strict and you can't really have too much wiggle room with the provisions. They're usually mandatory unless before a country joins the Berne Convention, 
they can file what's called a reservation. Over 20 countries have made reservations before, and they usually involve the listing of species under Appendix 2 or Appendix 3. So we'll go over the first three appendices right now. For the purposes of this lecture, we're not really going to talk about Appendix 4 because it doesn't have a lot of application what we're going over today. So Appendix 1 lists over 700 species of endemic plants. Appendix 2 lists strictly protected fauna species. So these are species that cannot be, quote, exploited at all. And then there's Appendix 3, which are protected fauna species, but despite the name, species under this classification can be exploited or culled. Um, a lot of the reservations revolve around larger conivores, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. So just like in North America, wolf management and whether or not wolf should be protected is a highly controversial topic in Europe as well. The reservation example I wanted to bring up for this lecture are four Eurasian wolves. So under Appendix 2, these species are supposed to be strictly protected. So there's no killing and there's no exploitation allowed. But at least 12 different countries have filed reservations about listing the wolf under Appendix 3, which would allow for the exploitation of the species as long as it's sustainably managed. Some of those countries include Spain, Turkey, Poland, Ukraine, Finland, and several more. Um, the reasoning behind wanting to move the wolves to Appendix 3 is similar to North America as well. There's a stigma around wolves, and for people raising livestock, there's concern that wolves are going to take their livestock and cost them a lot of money. Another aspect of the Berne Convention that I wanted to talk about is the Standing Committee. So the Standing Committee creates provisions and rulings related to habitat protection and management under Article 4. The committee will have annual meetings with all of its member states and countries every year. The, one of the more important things that are discussed at these meetings are decisions made towards the Emerald Network or the Network of Areas of Special Conservation Interest, or ASCI. Look at the ASCIs as Europe's version of the National Park Service, so a lot of pristine habitat with a lot of endemic wildlife and plants that live within them. Recommendations by the Stand Committee are used as guidance for creating obligations for convention members. It has to be noted, though, that these recommendations aren't legally binding, but their guidance carries interpretive value, which help towards convention members fulfilling the obligations of the Berne Convention. Berne Convention members also review violations. So the Berne Convention Standing Committee members can hear of a violation and they can actually send members out to do appraisals of damage and violations that countries may have committed. So now we're going to transition into talking about the nature directives. So the directives are binding legislation that EU authorities must apply with their domestic legal orders. To compare and contrast the Berne Convention with these nature directives, the Berne Convention is much larger in scope than the directives are. So the EU nature directives only include the 27 members of the European Union while the Berne Convention has 51 countries altogether. While the nature directives are smaller in scope, they're also somehow even more strict than the Berne Convention provisions are. Um, the third point I wanted to bring up is that the nature directives provide more clearly defined directions for protecting areas than the Berne Convention does. And like we discussed in our beginning summary of this lecture, the directives include two sub-directives, I guess we can call them for lack of a better word. Uh, the first one is the birds directive, and the second one is the habitat directive. So the first of the two nature directives is the birds directive. It was signed in 1979, and it's actually one of the first pieces of European Union wildlife policy or environmental policy that was ever passed. 
Its aim is to protect the 500 naturally occurring bird species in the European Union and their habitats. EU members will try to prevent five things under this directive. Those five things are the deliberate catching or killing of wild birds, uh, preventing significant disturbance, especially during rearing and breeding of chicks, nest and egg take or destruction, use of large scale non-selective capture or killing methods, and the keep transport or sale of wild birds. Member states also have to classify special protection areas and think of special protection areas as the EU equivalent of na national wildlife refuges. That's one of the best ways to compare and contrast this again to North America or the United States in general. Next, we'll talk about the habitat directive. The aim of this piece of legislation is to basically protect everything that isn't covered under the birds directive. So that includes mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, invertebrates, and plants. As long as it's not a bird and it's not bird habitat, it's fair game. It was adopted in 1992, which is strange to me that it took the European Union this long to uh, formalize some protections for all other members of the ecosystem that weren't birds. All of the obligations of this directive are identical to the birds directive, except it's applied more broadly to other wildlife and plants. To go over those again very quickly, the EU member states will promise to prevent deliberate catching or killing of wildlife or wild plants, to prevent significant disturbance, especially during rearing or breeding of young wildlife or plants, to prevent the destruction and take of nests, eggs, or young wildlife, to prevent the use of large-scale non-selective capture methods of wildlife or plants, and then to prevent the keep, transport, or sale of wildlife or wild plants. In addition to, the obligation, to these obligations, EU members must ensure that if a species is exploited, it must continue to be maintained at a favorable conservation status. This mostly applies to hunting regulations, making sure you don't overkill a certain game species. The Habitats Directive also has a design protected area called Special Areas of Conservation or SACs. Special protected areas from the Birds Directive and Special Areas of Conservation from the Habitat Directive combine together to make a network of protected areas called Natura 2000. It's interesting to note that one fifth of the EU's total territory is made up of Natura 2000 sites. <clears throat> Excuse me. Natura 2000 sites are the EU's contribution to the Emerald Network. If you remember when we were discussing the Standing Committee and their management of the Emerald Network. Um, so the 27 member states of the EU, the way they contribute to the Emerald Network is through these Natura 2000 sites. Another interesting tidbit of information I found was that proposing Natura 2000 sites is a prerequisite to joining the EU. And I think it's very forward thinking and it's very really cool in general, actually, that in order to become a member of this economic and political union, that you have to promise to set aside land to conserve and protect for future generations. I also wanted to highlight Article 6.3 and 6.4 of Natura 2000 uh, because they both play a really similar role to NEPA here in the United States. Article 6.3 states that assessment will be done if a project is expected to have a negative impact on a Natura 2000 site. And Article 6.4 states that compensatory me measures, excuse me, shall be taken if a project will have a negative impact and there is no alternative solution and must be carried out for imperative reasons of public interest. We'll briefly go over the reach of the Council of Europe and why it's important to European wildlife conservation. Um, so it was founded in 1949. It's a 46-member council that promotes human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in Europe. I wanted to use my handy-dandy pointer again to kind of show that you don't have to be a member of the EU to be part of the Council of Europe. 
You have countries like Greenland and Iceland that aren't even part of the European continent that are members. And some of the members that aren't part of the EU have joined the Council of Europe. The two countries on the European continent right now that aren't part of the Council of Europe are Belarus and Russia. And that's due to them being kicked out of the council because of their actions currently in the Ukrainian war. Um, I wanted to highlight that the council is distinct from the EU in that it can't make laws. It can only push for the enforcement of international agreements. And the takeaway of this slide that I want you to get is that the Council is important to European wildlife policy is because it administers the Berne Convention, and it by far has the most influence on what the Berne Convention does and proposes. The Council can't make laws, but it can definitely influence uh, ent other entities making laws. Now we'll talk about the challenges of transboundary population management, by far the biggest culprit of this is the lack of coordinated conservation efforts between the nations of Europe. So over 50% of all terrestrial wildlife on the planet have ranges that cross an international border, but cooperation across the board is always lacking. And because you have so many different cultures and values and attitudes across Europe, it could be really difficult to come to an agreement on how to manage a wildlife population. One example I was able to find in my research is deer feeding. So deer feeding is considered a legal obligation in Germany, Romania, Croatia, and several other countries throughout Eastern Europe. But if you're to go to the Netherlands or parts of Switzerland, for example, deer feeding is completely illegal and against the law. I found a really interesting case study on physical transboundary barriers in Europe in the mid 2010s, and I thought this would be a pretty good uh, topic to bring up. So in 2015, Europe received a massive influx of Im immigrants and refugees, mostly from the Middle East and mostly from Syria, because they're trying to get away from the Syrian civil war and find a little bit of salvation. So at this point in 2015, and I'll use my pointer again, Hungary was a massive anti-refugee country, and it, it already closed its border to refugees. Slovenia was also getting sick of refugees, so it built a razor wire fence along its border with Croatia, which you see right there. Maybe not the clear since the map's a little small, but that unfortunately had unforeseen consequences on wildlife. Uh, they couldn't easily travel between countries anymore, and it actually resulted in habitat fragmentation and population fragmentation. So um, scientists and biologists are actually fearing that mostly wolves and the threatened Eurasian lynx are going to inbreed because of this fence. Bears are going to do slightly better since their populations are doing a little bit better and they're a little bit more robust, but it's still going to have negative influences on the predators uh, slash carnivores of this area. So last thing I wanted to do with this lecture today is highlight a conservation success story in Europe. And the species I chose to showcase that is the Eurasian beaver. So similarly to its North American cousin, the Eurasian beaver started declining heavily in the 17th century. This was because of a huge market for its meat, its fur, and castorium. If you're unfamiliar what castorium is, it's a gland by beavers that they combine with their urine to mark their territory. And for humans, uh, they use castorium to produce food and perfumes in women, which is bizarre. Anyway, by the 20th century, there were only about 1,200 beavers left. But because of heavy conservation and reintroduction efforts that started in the 1950s, beaver populations have been able to stabilize. So from 1960 to 2016, beaver populations have increased by 16,700%. And that is not a typo.
So let's wrap this lecture up today by going over our talking points one more time. We defined the coexistence conservation paradigm. We described the ins and outs of the Bern Convention. We detailed the EU nature directives and the two pieces of legislation that make up this policy. We went over participating countries in the Council of Europe and the role the Council of Europe plays in European wildlife management. We described a few challenges of transboundary wildlife management and then I quickly highlighted a conservation success story of the Eurasian beaver. Hopefully all of you can answer these three questions now that I've wrapped up this lecture. Here are my citations. And I also wanted to give credit where credit is due with some of the amazing wildlife photography that was used throughout this presentation. Thanks. Mm -hmm.